find the final list, I need to see if I'm going to or whatever. Yeah, I'm going to give it a couple of things. Uh, this is related yeah. to our most of the The first one is about my experience with LASO. And, uh, and you mentioned also some medical problems. We talked about markers. Our experience is that um, it's not a good idea to use LASO in those you measure breaks when, when variables are correlated. And you actually end up being, you know, muscle is very parsimonious and picks whatever chart. Well, there is some, some randomicity in the ability of muscle. So people, I mean, we use, for example, L1 and 2, we use, you know, put a little bit of a 2 norm, and this, in some cases, saves the day because maybe biologists are happy to have this longer list of maybe correlated genes when they have those problems. But on the other hand, in terms of identification, I think at least my, I'm not, at the moment at least, I'm not completely satisfied with what I get out of. So I, I think it's a very difficult problem to, to select the right, right, the right description out of the small number of data, I think. And the second remark I want to make is about, so to speaking in defense of small or small scale approaches. Uh, we heard yesterday and today again that whenever you use images, uh, you invariably uh, get the bore filters and stuff. Uh, I think uh, Guillermo showed something which was, well, actually, if you're using data as features, uh, this is not necessarily the case. Depending, of course, on, on the, um, let's say, small is, 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 uh, versus large, if you constrain your domain, uh, some naturally, in a sense, like, for example, you can build a background model, which is basically, is, is, for example, a steel camera, even a slightly moving, or a slowly moving camera, which is actually building on the idea that the images that you're looking at, or the patches you're looking at, are almost always the same. So in that case, you're actually sort of generalizing the idea of selecting uh, some of the data as features, and you end up by being something which is close to vector quantization, or but sort of a sparse coding in which you're picking uh, the, something which is typically the noise version of, of, the, of the images you're looking at. Uh, so I think that there is some room for, uh, maybe it's not uh, as general as what we heard, but I feel that you know, one, one way or the other, we have to fight against for millions of years. So you know, maybe, I mean, the evolution is really, uh, so, so astounding, and so astonishing for me that uh, whenever we can use some prior information without making any effort, like for example, the type of images we're looking at or the type of signals we're using, with, even if our representation does not generalize, as far as I'm using a supervised data, I think, uh, supervised technique, I think this is something we should continue looking at. Okay, so uh, I think we should start the discussion. I don't know whether to hit Lorenzo to start. Uh, well, is anybody want to ask questions, or shall we? Uh, okay. I have very strong feelings about this reconstruction thing. Uh, I think we are. I th <laughs> which, which reconstruction? <laughs> data, data reconstruction. Uh, when you when you use a when when you concentrate on on, on a graph labeling problem. The data, the data space is 2 to the power of n squared large. Much, much larger than the huge space of labelings. You have no chance of even getting close to a good estimate of the, your probability distribution over your graphs. And so, so I think most of the information processing issues are discriminative issues. I don't want the doctor to reconstruct the, the, the the generative model of my biopsy. I want him to get the few bits about my survival probability correctly out of this data uh, space. And this is what we have to learn. Yeah. So just a question to that point. What do you do if you have lots of unlabeled data and few labeled data? Well, if you have unlabeled data, the general wisdom is that you have a large number of cost functions and people believe religiously in their cost functions. And you have basically very little validation technology available. 
And so what you do is you go to benchmarks, you go to the real world and see how successful you are. But it's, 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 the validation is not even close to the state of the art in validation what we have for uh, supervised learning for classification and regression. And that's why people call, for example, in, 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 in clustering, people think it's an art. It's not a science. Because you, you, you stand up, you get a new idea for another labeling cost function, and you let it run. Yeah, but in this case, like, if you, have, you don't have enough labels, you try to build a generative model, you try to model the inputs. That, that is the mistake. Uh, if your data is noisy or corrupted, then you're not going to go very far with supervised learning techniques, right? Particularly if you have few labels, for example. You have to make some assumptions about the underlying data distribution. Yes, but these assumptions are not even close to estimating the data source. Why, if I want to do face recognition, why do I have to be able to reproduce the 3D appearance of a face? When I'm just interested in this one label, these log k bits if I have k people. Okay, uh, not that I'm advocating in favor of the construction, especially the construction of the data. I think that's completely the wrong uh, direction. But the, just to balance the case uh, that you just mentioned, there are also situations where the space where you want to do inference, uh, regardless of how big the data space is, is infinitely bigger than that. And so you know, in vision, we operate in scenes that are made of surfaces that have certain jumps, the topology, reflectance functions, illuminations, vantage points, occlusions. And this is infinitely bigger dimensionality than the number of images, no matter how many you have. So now, uh, you might have <coughs> queries from this. So yes, you make decisions. So you are know, you, extracting bits. <coughs> because you don't tell me a priori what these questions are. Uh, actively, the dimensionality of the inference space is infinitely bigger than the dimensionality of the data space. Yes, that's why I believe it's elusive if you don't tell me what you want to solve to have a general representation which can kill it all. I would agree with that, and so that, that's where the task comes in. That's what the yes, you, you have to pick the task cleverly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I th the point you're making is in uh, very deep. It's something on which I've been oscillating a lot. It's absolutely clear that classification is not about coding and has nothing to do for the reason that you were mentioning. On the other hand, when the system is scaling, you are not here to classify A and B, but you have tens of thousands of classes. And you have no idea what's going to be the question that is going to be asked to you next. And when you are reaching that kind of problem, which is scaling, it gets pretty dangerous to destroy brutally data. And at that point, the ability to reconstruct is a way to check that you haven't destroyed brutally some data that could, in fact, have been crucial to differentiate an illness, which is potential cancer or not cancer. And then if you think in these terms that it's dangerous to destroy when you don't know the question you are going to be asked on, <coughs> the idea of saying sparsity, again, sparsity also was a big problem for me for, uh, in the recent years because I wanted to get out of it thinking, okay, we are not again compressing. On the other hand, you always have this uh, Occam rather uh, argument, which is you are looking for the minimum number of explaining factors which were beautifully showed in the uh, first two lectures. So it's not so clear, I would say. And I think there is a point for not exact reconstruction, but reconstructing something which is equivalent in terms of information. And for that, probably our visual system or auditory system are good <coughs> ways to check. Or, uh, But it's not so simple, unless it's A or B. But these are simple problems. Yeah. Why can't we see infrared? Would be very nice to, to see heat sources. It's very interesting for, for, for real life. Yeah, I, I just want to mention just, just one thing that is interesting. So from the anecdotic perspective, and Jan, you have to remind me. About 10 years ago, this discussion happened at IMA. And in one corner was a, a Stu Giman, 
I mean, that was young, and they were having exactly the same discussion. Yeah. They didn't have balls, but it was very interesting. The, those balls. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Show that the discussion but is I interesting. I something that I think follows up from, from what you just said, and I just want to raise the issue and then try to answer your question, which I think is a much easier than this one. There is a lot of work in the recent year on people designing optimal, optimal filters to preserve information. So basically mutual information between input <coughs> and output. So that's kind of an intermediate step. I want a compact representation. I don't know what I'm going to be doing that. So I want to design a compact representation that maximizes mutual information with the signal. And this is a, a work by Robert Calderbank and, and others. So it's kind of an intermediate step. So I wanted just to, to mention that out there. Uh, but I want to just answer you, because I, I think it's easier. This question is very hard, and the other is easier. So when we see parameters, the parameter basically says a model. In the, in the sparsity, it says, I know my data is a Laplacian, but I have no idea what's the decay. That's the lambda. So it turns out that there is, and, and I know that uh, people like Anne you and you and, and Shimon have worked on, on, on information theory, and they might correct me. In, so the concept of universal modeling says, OK, you have a class of models, and you don't know which one it is. So you don't know the lambda. Can I just pick a different model from a different class that has no parameters and that asymptotically will perform as the oracle? And that's a very cool question. So there is a Laplacian, which is the best ever. Great, you don't know which one. Can I just go into a larger space of distribution and pick one that will be asymptotic? It turns out that problem is solved, OK, in, in, in information theory. It's called universal modeling. And it's constructive. It's not that, yes, there is. It tells you how to find it. So, uh, and, and it tells you either how to learn it from data or learn it offline. And it shows there are multiple techniques to do it. And it shows that asymptotically converges sublinear to the oracle. So that's something interesting in general to know that sometimes maybe we should, we should be a bit careful trying to work too hard on the model. Because there are theories out there that say, OK, I can try to help you to kind of get a meta model. And then there is the people, the Bayesian people, that say, I don't care. I just put a distribution on everything you don't know. But that's, yeah, just, just, just to wrap my around here. So OK, carry on this reasoning when you have supervised learning. Why we are not just using this kind of reasoning? Yeah, I need to know. They're doing cross-validation and freaking out with adaptation. Oh, people are doing <coughs> cross-validation because they don't. No, no, I'm saying, OK, I know why they're doing cross-validation. <laughs> people are doing cross-universal modeling. In when, why? I mean, isn't what aggregation tries to get at this, right? I'm not going to say why people are not. I mean, it's, it, but we could. I think. Well, I think I'm, the I'm, same, not, the same I'm not too sure. To I'm not too sure. I know what answer to your question. I do know that very often we don't look at the right books. <laughs> but That's this, is, this, is, like, this, this is, is like saying density yeah, estimation. No, you have universal models for density estimation, right? But they're only universal in the, the limit, right? You right. can approximate. Yeah, so I say asymptotic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I in say practice, asymptotically. Yeah. Well, good luck. With oh, that. in practice, they work, they work pretty good because images are pretty large. Images are pretty large. So I can show you, they, they work pretty good. So I'm saying it's not the solution. Nothing yeah. is the solution yeah. to everything. Yeah. It's just one app. They, they work for images. The well, for images, well, 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 images are pretty large is a problem, right? Because they're in high dimensions. So no, pretty large, I mean, they have enough pixels for me to be asymptotic. But that's. that's no, but the, that's but the asymptotic is not in the number of pixels, in the number of images. images. No, 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 the asymptotic. Yeah, OK, I'm going to. So when. Yeah. I'm going to just. I have to explain something. When we do sparse modeling, we work on patches. So data is a patch. It's an 8 by 8 patch. That's my data. So an image has a lot of patches. And that's my data. So I didn't say that, and I think Ben also didn't say that. Right. When we work on images and we do sparse modeling, we never work on the whole image. You work on all the overlapping patches, right. and that means that there is a lot. But which in the distribution you try to find the distribution on the image, which is corresponding one to one to one image, or the one of all the images that depending uh, what you, how much you want to adapt. But I, I just, you know, we can have a long discussion. I don't want to. 
what, what I want to say is there, there are theories there that give answers under certain scenarios, nothing is a completely, and, I, and I, I just thought it was worth mentioning these are, you know, very smart people in information theory that have developed those theories, and I think they're worth paying attention to them even if they don't solve the problem, it's just a good cultural reading. Uh, and then to say, yeah, but this doesn't solve my problem. I think it's easier than to solve in the generative discriminative models, which is a hard, hard problem. <laughs> problem to, it's less philosophical. <clears throat> Still start to get, feel hungry or? <clears throat> Maybe it's a, uh, just a kind of question whether, uh, just in case anybody knows the answer, do we know of any result that gives you a unique representation but does not allow for reconstruction? What I have in mind is something like Johnson in the Strauss, in which in the basic formulation you get and then padding, a random and padding that preserves distances within epsilon. But this results, this depends on uh, um, the number of images you want to separate for the points in the high dimensional space. So this, this naively looks like a result which gives you you know, a unique representation, epsilon unique, uh, but does not by itself allow for reconstruction. So the one, I mean, basically, oh, I uh, So I think the simplest thing is that if you have a, a d-dimensional manifold, you take a random projection into 2D, 2D plus one dimensions, you have a one-to-one -one map. And if you want distance preserving, you go into d times the bigger constant, you actually have an isometry. Again, these are generic maps. But, it, but this is for any manifold. So there's no geometric structure whatsoever, so it has, says nothing about algorithms. You can make manifolds rather, rather nasty. I mean, these are kind of like the, the um, so it was wrote by Ken Clarkson that, show, that shows the isometric property. But kind of the more, the more general one, that random projection preserves uh, dis uh, local distances in the manifold is basically the Whitney embedding theorem. That's how you prove the Whitney embedding theorem is just do random projections. And there are results on, on, on when you draw phase for signal. Stability results that you will get signals that are basically with probability one, there will be only one, but not necessarily you can reconstruct. Yeah. Um, Lorenz probably wants to say something, but the reason, by the way, I'm asking this question because very often uh, <coughs> I've been saying that for recognition or classification or whatever, you don't need a recognition. But the question is whether it, that's really true or hidden there, there is always the possibility to be close to that. Yeah. So there, there are, uh, a lot of the models that people talked about here for, you know, based on dictionary notion, there are models for which you can easily reconstruct the input from the representation, but inferring the representation is somewhat expensive. Um, so, you know, the demo talked about this technique where you can train an efficient predictor. Then there are other methods that nobody talks about. Uh, methods where you learn analysis filters and you don't reconstruct. So things like product of experts, for example, or most ICA methods are encoder-only methods where you try to find a sparse code that is directly computed from the input using filters and a, a mind um, And There is no explicit reconstruction. The reconstruction process is actually very painful and expensive and doesn't work very well. And the main problem with those models is that training, training them is hell because you have to use things like convergent divergence, things like this that, that we are very really difficult to, uh, to make them So Twice. It's a hard concept of that. You cannot do it or it's expensive. Because what you're saying is that you could do it. It's just that you maybe it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to do it, but it's still there. Yeah. So ICA, actually, you can uh, you do reconstruct the directions. It depends on what version of ICA. But the basic version of ICA, you just enforce that the uh, analysis matrix uh, is for rank, for square ICA. And that basically is a way of uh, running the function. 
Well, if you do the sort of the cumulant ICA, you do reconstruct the directions exactly. Well, exactly, within your precision. Yes, there are forms. There are forms where you, you know, like this example is part of the experts, you know, the experts for people division. It's, you know, it's, it's feed forward only. You don't have an explicit uh, decoder to reconstruct. Uh, and that makes the learning very complicated because you can have reconstruct. I think there's two things which are very different. Can you speak louder? I, say, I think there's two things which are very different because uh, when you, your data lies in a low dimensional manifold, yes, with random projection and few random projection, you can characterize it. And then Tommy spoke about Johnston Lindesberg theorem, which says that with log n random projections, you can preserve distances. These two things have nothing to do one respect to the other because it's not because you preserve distances that you don't lose crucial information. You are just preserving distances between endpoints. Now, if you work in high dimension, that's of course very true, but distances can be completely meaningless because Euclidean distances in high dimension are meaningless. So, yes, you can project in log n dimension and preserve your Euclidean distances which are meaningless, but it's not clear that you will have captured something uh, fundamentally important about the data. So, I think that this mix between these two conditions where you know the data is in low dimension and then indeed your projection is able even to reconstruct the signal from the Lindesberg theory, Johnston Lindesberg theory, is not so similar as it seems. Well, you can prove one from the other, so they have to be. I mean, you can prove that you can embed a d-dimensional manifold in d-dimensional spaces from the johnson lindenstrauss lemma. Yeah, it? but when you have endpoints... Ah, so you, you just take a grid of your manifold. Your endpoints can live in anything. That's true. It's more general. johnson lindenstrauss is more general. I, I'm, saying, not, I'm saying uh, the use in which, uh, from what I understand from what Tommy was saying, was saying you have endpoints, you can always get log n projections that will characterize these s points. That presupposes nothing about the dimensionality because it's just n point. You don't know anything else. That's true. That has nothing to do with the situation where there exists a low dimensional data where all the data will belong. Here, it's just you took n points, of course n points, whatever, even if the data is white noise, it doesn't, white noise doesn't belong to low dimensional manifold endpoints will still be reduced with a log n projection. But Stefan, my point was simply that if you take this face value, it says you cannot reconstruct exactly. yeah. those points, yeah. but you can classify them. That's right. That's, uh, that, that's, that's if your point. distance was good, if your distance was good, <laughs> the problem is that usually the distance is not so good to classify. I said for the end of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I won. I got the aggression. Okay, so someone has to be. is more. His name is better. Right, so then. The important thing to decouple is that there are some structures which are which which are tied with uh, with, with, with good optimization algorithms. Like that, you know, the, you know the, these pictures I was drawing, where you can get these convex hulls. There are some that are very computable, and then there are some that are not. So, for example, the hypercube has has an exponential number of vertices in the dimension. We can optimize it over, over it very efficiently. The uh, there are polytopes and combinatorics like. Um, the, the, the sum of all rank one sine vectors, and take their convex hull, you can't test whether or not a point is in there or not. However, Johnson Lindestrauss is still going to say, you project into n dimensions, then all the points are preserved. So I think the thing to decouple is that there are some structures that are easier to compute with than others. 
the, 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 the ability to classify says nothing about computation. The ability to distinguish points says nothing about computation. Uh, that's like a, a different language, just no, those are, those are, those are probably just like is in the case in, uh, in, 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 in uh, I was going to say in estimation theory, the boundary between detection and estimation is usually not that big. But I think it's the, I think it's the difference between. Yeah. And I think that's what, it's just not that the computation, not that it's not, yeah. is there any transform yeah. that you can prove that preserves everything you ever wanted? That you will never be able to reconstruct. Not computation, you just never. And if that boundary shrinks, then we say that to be ready for everything that we don't know what it is, which yeah. was Stefan said, we will have to be reconstructing. Because the moment you're, I think my interpretation of Tommy's question is, can you prove to me that the moment you are not able to reconstruct, there are some classification questions you won't be able to answer? If that's the case, then we will have to reconstruct them. Oh, I see. <coughs> If you, if you show there is a gap, if there is no gap, then we're fine. But if there is a gap, and we don't know what we're going to be doing That's in 10 years. Because there's, there's two sides. I'm reversing the yeah, 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 yeah. to say. Because there's two sides. Of this. I'm sure we could find an easy example where it says that, yeah. where there's yeah. one reconstruction question. Where, where, or sorry, there's one classification yeah. problem yeah. that you could solve where you can't reconstruct. But you, you're saying, I want to be able to solve all classification because problems. Because I, I was following step that's step 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 You don't know what you're going to be doing. So I say, yeah, if, the, if there is no gap, then we have to reconstruct at the end. If there is gap, and at the theoretical level, forget if you want to compute how, just forget. I, I, just I, I, I was complaining the computation. But obviously, if you don't assume anything, of course there is nothing. You can, you can ask about any feature that you lose. You can ask about it, I'm, right? I would You'll be have very, if I don't. So I think there's a, two aspects to the construction. One is the task, and the other one is the nuisances. Because uh, uh, depending on your data formation process, and that's, so this is data dependent, not task dependent, there are aspects of the data that you are not interested in. For instance, if you're interested in recognition, uh, you really are not interested, you're, you're interested in recognizing things regardless of vantage point, regardless of conclusion, regardless of information, and so on and so forth. So, uh, if you want to be able to handle any query that requires invariance or insensitivity to nuisance factor in the data formation process, then what you want to reconstruct, or what you want the ability to reconstruct, is not the data, but is the data minus the part of the data that doesn't matter for yeah. any task, it's but depending on the data formation exactly. process. Now, I think what is critical, in my view, and this is what makes vision different and interesting with respect to it, other data modality like uh, olfactory, tactile, or chemical sense, and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and range is the fact that, well, range, range, that's more than, is the fact that this quotient, if you wish, uh, in some cases is a thin set, which means that even if you cannot reconstruct the data, uh, you can still retain statistics from the data that are very, very, very small compared to the dimensionality of the data, and yet, you're able to reconstruct, not the data, who cares about reconstructing the data, but you get to reconstruct the part of the data that matters to your task. And so that depends on the nuisance, and that's something that is specified by the data modality and by the class of tasks that you want. So if you want to do rendering, obviously reflectance is important. Uh, if you want to do navigation or, or, or tracking document manipulation and other special tasks, then reflectance is relevant. If you want to do recognition, then vantage point is relevant. If you want to do navigation, it's not. And so the class of task determines uh, what uh, what you want to be able to reconstruct. Yeah, but what if this class of tasks is very, very big? Right? Like so there are one, things yeah. about humans, right? They're not just trying to recognize illumination or uh, anything like that. Thousands of different tasks. Right. So, so if you if you include every possible task, <laughs> that includes as a task reconstructing the image. There you go. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Then, then the gap is zero. Right. I think you're right. I, I mean, it, the goal is not to reconstruct the signal, because otherwise it would be coding. The goal is to reconstruct sufficiently rich, and I think the point of view that, that, that you've put is appropriate. But then what is sufficiently rich is very complicated. Until now, probably the best test is the ability to reconstruct something which looks similar from a visual or, or an auditory point of view. We know that we are not complete from a vision or auditory point of view, or kind of illusions. <coughs> but that's probably, uh, 
unless yep. the, the framework is better specified, in which case you may be able to specify exactly the sufficient statistics you have in mind. Okay. That's probably the good framework. You're okay, and then I think we... I think we have to make fundamental assumptions about the world. And the, it, the, the situation could be the following. I'm not saying it is the following, but it could be. The signal in the data could be infinite, and then there is noise on top of it, which limits our abilities to reason. For any finite set of subtasks we want to solve, I need a very low dimensional part of that signal. If that's the case, I don't really care about my ability to solve, to have a representation where I can solve an infinite amount of tasks so yeah. that I really need all the properties. I make a decision that there is a ranking of tasks and a finite number I can solve reasonably with a, with a small uh, amount of that signal. And I, I believe that this uh, models a lot of applications where we want to have intelligent behavior. And my point that we are not seeing in the infrared and the ultraviolet uh, goes in that direction. Evolution decided this is not necessary. Okay. Uh, so I think nothing can now prevent us to have a good lunch outside. I think lunch is outside. Right? Yeah, lunch is outside. And uh, let me thank you again to the participants to the session and remind you that we are going to be back here at 2. Right? Yeah. Reconstruction is intellectually a to. Still, but we almost never.